MC4. Now, before we get started, uh, I just want to take a moment to say how much it means to us that you're all here today. Um, looking around, I see a lot of familiar faces and people we've been working with for a while here, uh, people in the industry who have been pushing this forward for a while. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for all of the work that you've been doing to push virtual reality forward. Thank you, guys. Now, we're all here because we are legitimately excited about the future. And we are committed to making it a reality. And we believe that one day, almost everyone is going to use virtual reality to improve how we work, how we play, and how we connect with each other. But we know that the most important technologies don't start off mainstream. Right? In fact, a lot of them seem uh, maybe even too crazy or complex to start. And the conventional thinkers will always say that there's going to be something more familiar right, that delivers enough of the value. So why build a completely new platform? Right, they say, why build the PC when most people just want a word processor? Why build the whole internet when most people like dialing up through AOL? <laughs> why put a computer in your pocket when most people are just asking for a phone that texts well? And why build virtual reality when most people think 2D screens are pretty good today? You know, the reality is, at every step along the way, the future is built by the people who believe it can be better, the people who are dedicated to creating that foundation for all of us to build upon. And that's why we're all here. And that's why I am excited to be here with you. So thanks for all coming out today. Now, a lot has happened since the last time we were all here. A couple of years ago, uh, most of us wouldn't have predicted that today there would be doctors prescribing VR for pain relief in hospitals. Or that overall there would be more than 100 million VR app downloads out there. Uh, virtual reality is about imagining the world as it could be. And last year we talked about how VR can put people first and put us at the center of the experience more than any other computing platform out there. And that's because VR is unique in creating this sense of presence. Like you're right there with another person or in another place. Now, some people say that VR is isolating and antisocial. I actually think it's the opposite. Yeah, today we need this big headset, and that's not great. We're working on it. But saying that VR is isolating because it's immersive is a really narrow view of the world that you're all building. The reality is we all have limits to our reality. You know, places we can't go, people we can't see, things we can't do. And opening up more of those experiences to all of us, that's not isolating, that's freeing. And it's already starting to happen. You know, not long ago, if you were paralyzed, your chance of recovery was almost zero. But today, there are groups like the Walk Again Project that are using Rift to help patients see their legs moving again. And that helps restore neural function in their brain. And in one study, all eight patients who had this therapy regained some motor control. So this is a video where someone is starting to take their first steps towards kicking a ball again. And then there were people like Dorothy Howard, Dorothy is an 80-year-old grandmother living in the UK. She owns an Oculus Rift. And a few weeks ago, she posted in the official uh, Rift group on Facebook to troubleshoot an issue. And she said, uh, I'm not going to do the accent well. <laughs> I bought a Rift as I am no longer fit to go on holidays. It is fantastic, and I'm looking at spectacular worlds. Dorothy is awesome. <laughs> Now, now, a lot of us are probably thinking, all right, maybe I don't have a disability. I can, I can see my friends you know, whenever I want to. I'm definitely not an 80-year-old British grandmother. All right, fine. You got me. But look, if you can't think of any way that your reality can be better, then you're not thinking hard enough. 
Now take your work. How long is your commute every single day? Now I don't know anyone who sits in traffic and thinks to themselves, man, right here, this is the best that reality can be. <laughs> now a lot of people have ideas on how to make transportation better. Right? Self-driving cars, hyperloops, and you know, don't get me wrong, I love all of that stuff, but you know, it's 2017, and the biggest trend in transportation is that it's a lot easier to move bits around than atoms. Last month, uh, one of my neighbors told me that his company is distributed, so they do all their meetings in virtual reality. This is actually the Facebook Spaces team's uh, regular Friday meeting, and they do it in spaces because they're located in all different cities. And this way they don't have to get on a plane or drive in cars. <laughs> I, I hope that's not what they're discussing in their meetings, but you know. Um, you know, and it's much better than a video conference. Uh, you can see people's gestures, you can actually do work together. You know, but, but this is bigger than, um, than just recreating uh, the physical world. Right? In my office, on my desk, I have, I have one screen. But in VR, I can have this completely custom setup. Right, I can have people pop in, I can show them what I'm working on on a bunch of different displays. But still, this is even bigger than this. It's even bigger than saving a few hours on your commute every day or a few thousand dollars on your setup. Right, this year, I've been traveling around the country, and a lot of the places that I've visited just don't have as much economic opportunity as we do here. But we have the ability to help create a world where fewer of us are limited to only doing jobs that are nearby us. Enabling us to be present anywhere creates opportunities for people everywhere. Now beyond work, you know, think about all the experiences that you may never get to have. Uh, most of us will probably never get to experience zero gravity or travel to the International Space Station, but you can in VR. And you know what? That's somewhere that I think I'd like to take my daughters one day. Or think about the education opportunities. You know, this one, this is a real program at Stanford that helps uh, pediatric cardiology students visualize heart issues and how to fix them. There should be a version of this for every education lesson and job training program out there. Or let's think about entertainment. You know, our reality can be a lot better there too. Because I don't think anyone's ideal of playing games with friends is that you're each sitting at your own home looking at your own screen. Or we want to be together. And in VR, you can do this because it's immersive. You know, this year, Echo Arena uh, won best VR game at E3. And you know, this is a game that I think most of us have been waiting to play since we read Ender's Game in middle school. Uh, you know, I think more games are going to be like this uh, a decade from now and my team didn't beat me. <laughs> but there's more than games here. You know, what about live sports and, and concerts? You know, we're, we're creating a new experience uh, that we're gonna release next year called Venues. And Venues lets you watch live concerts and live sports and premieres of movies and TV shows all around the world with your friends and with thousands of other people at the same time. And it's another example of how VR is going to bring us closer together in ways that might not be possible in the physical world. So here, here's a, that was a look at, at our early development there. All right, so whenever people say that we're building virtual reality because we're not satisfied with the one we live in, my answer is, of course we are. And that's a good thing. And we believe that the future can be a lot better. Optimism is good. Now, it's true that nothing is ever going to replace being with someone in person or doing something physical. But when we can't experience those things, when we run up against the limits of reality, VR is going to make our reality that much better. So we're setting a goal. We want to get a billion people in virtual reality. And there are going to be challenges to work through. You know, we have to build a safe environment, and we have to make sure that virtual reality is a force for good in the world. 
And we have to make sure that virtual reality is accessible to everyone. Now, today, there are two main categories of VR products. There's mobile, like Gear VR, which is affordable, and you can take it with you. But it's not as powerful as a PC. And it doesn't have positional tracking, uh, so you can't move through space. And then there's PC VR, like the Rift. And this, this is the world-class uh, virtual reality experience, but it's a little more expensive, and it, it ties you to a fixed computer. If we're going to get a billion people in virtual reality, we have to keep working on both affordability and quality. But we also have to find the sweet spot in the middle, that high-quality, affordable experience that doesn't tether you to a PC. So today, I'm excited to announce the first product in this sweet spot. It's an all-new standalone headset that doesn't require you to snap in a phone or attach a cable. We're calling it Oculus Go. And Oculus Go is the most accessible VR experience ever. And it's, it's an all-in-one headset. It's great for playing games, for watching movies, and for hanging out with friends. And the price is only $199. And it's going to ship early next year. Early next year. All right, but that's actually that's not the only thing we're working on uh, in the sweet spot here between mobile and PC. You know, last year, we talked about how the key to unlocking new categories of VR experiences is inside-out tracking. Right? It's this idea that instead of having you know, cameras around the room that look at you uh, to determine your location, you, you put the cameras on the headset and use computer vision software to determine your location as you move through space. So last year at, at OC3, uh, we gave you an early look at our progress on building inside-out tracking. And today, I am happy to announce that we are going to have Santa Cruz headsets in your hands, in the hands of developers, in the next year. And it's going to ship with six degree of freedom tracked controllers. And so this is, a, this is a big deal, right? Because this is the first time that anyone has ever shown a complete experience of inside out tracking working on a standalone headset and fully tracked controllers. So here's what it looks like. up here today, I am more committed than ever to the future of virtual reality. It's not about escaping reality. It's about making it better. It's about curing diseases, connecting families, spreading empathy, rethinking work, improving games, and yes, bringing us all closer together. VR is about imagining the world as it could be. And the road ahead, it won't always be easy. But we have some of the most talented people in the world here in this room working on this. And if we all do what we need to, 
if we all keep working on building great experiences and putting them in the hands of more people, that VR will change the way we see the world and it will make all of our lives a lot better. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being on this journey with us. And now I'd like to introduce, for the first time at Oculus Connect, our new head of virtual reality, Hugo Barra. That's great. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thank you, Mark, and good morning. First of all, a very warm welcome to all of our developers here today. This entire show is made for you. And welcome to our friends from the media, our partners, our colleagues from Oculus and Facebook, and a special welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream on Facebook and Twitch right now. We also have folks joining us in VR. We're live streaming for the very first time in 4K 360. We've got a phenomenal Oculus Connect for you this year with 44 talks, over 100 speakers, and more than 2,900 attendees, which makes this the biggest Connect yet. It's also my first Oculus Connect, but my journey in VR started 20 years ago. It was my freshman year in college and my first winter break since moving to the US. I took an internship in LA at Walt Disney Imagineering, working on this project called Disney Quest, which was the world's first VR theme park. And back in the late 90s, this is what VR looked like. <laughs> These were CRT headsets with VGA resolution. They were not stereo, but biocular. And you needed three SGI Onyx machines stacked up together to drive them. This was cutting edge for those days, and it was awesome. Now, fast forward to 2017. I got this incredible opportunity to join the Oculus team at Facebook. But before diving into this awesome new job, I decided to take some time off and do a mini world tour. And I took my Oculus Rift with me everywhere I went. I got to show VR to friends and family around the globe. But the highlight was when I took it back home to Brazil. This is my dad. Now you have to understand, in my family, my mom is really the techie one. She's the one who likes all the cool toys that I bring home. And there she is, that's my mom. <laughs> and my dad was pretty skeptical about VR. So I got him to try it. And watch him here. You're going to see he's going to throw off a lantern off a cliff and then look down over the edge <laughs> to watch it fall. And then he says in Portuguese in this video, que coisa fantástica, what a fantastic thing. That's a lot for my dad to say. He's not really a tech guy. He just really enjoyed that experience. That feeling my dad got, that is the magic of presence in VR. And it's unlike anything else. All of us in this room have shared VR with a friend or a family member and seen that same reaction. Once you feel it, there's no going back. You know it's the future. And that's why we're here, to share that magic with the world. So now, let's talk about how we make it. Let's start with hardware. You know, building VR headsets requires a fundamentally different approach compared to any other consumer electronics. You really have to understand how the human perceptual system works, and you need to learn how to convince the brain. This means delivering the right set of photons and sound waves to make the perceptual system believe you're really there. It's that amazing sense of presence which makes the VR hardware disappear when you're in VR. As Mark said earlier, we're expanding our Oculus device portfolio. We're doing that to get more people in VR. We're doing that to extend the reach of the apps and experiences that you develop. 
Before we dive into new products, I want to briefly talk about where our consumer VR journey started. Our partnership with Samsung is bringing VR to millions around the world faster than anyone expected. And Gear VR is by far the most popular way to experience VR today, thanks to Samsung's global reach and amazing technology combined with the work of this developer community. Back in April this year, in partnership with Samsung, we launched the Gear VR controller, and that was a big upgrade for the Gear VR experience. To put it in perspective, when Gear VR users pick up their controller, they average 50 minutes in VR that day, which is a 60% increase. And they're looking to do more in VR too. In fact, they download 25% more apps, which goes to show the new controller and the apps that you build for it are making a big difference. Gear VR set the beginning of the VR consumer era. We're really proud of this community that we built in partnership with Samsung, and we're going to continue to push this VR innovation frontier together. Next up, let's talk about standalone VR. As Mark said, standalone is this sweet spot between mobile and PC VR, and we're starting to invest in this new category with a focus on two things. Accessibility. We're going to bring more people into VR. And innovation. We're pushing the envelope on the experiences that you can build. Oculus Go, as you saw, is our first standalone product. It's an all-in-one experience, hands down, the easiest way for people to get into VR. And for our developer community, it's a platform for you to expand the reach of the apps and experiences that you're already building. You know, we think people are going to spend a lot more time in VR when they get a standalone device. So we really wanted Oculus Go to be a leap in both comfort and visual clarity. First of all, Oculus Go is super lightweight, despite the fact that it's an all-in-one full mobile computer. Secondly, we designed soft elastic traps, straps with really high adjustability. So it feels natural to wear it. And it practically disappears when you're in VR. And third, we designed a facial interface with a new mesh fabric that's extremely breathable and a foam layer that conforms beautifully to your face. It feels incredibly soft, soft to wear. We also wanted Oculus Go to deliver the best visual clarity of any VR product we've ever built. So Oculus Go will ship with an all-new custom optical design. The lenses are the next generation of the ones on Oculus Rift. Same wide field of view and significantly reduced glare. Now, we matched these custom lenses with a WQHD fast switch LCD display that is specifically optimized for VR. It has a much wider or higher pixel fill factor uh, than OLEDs. And that has a dramatic effect on visual clarity. It reduces the screen door effect, so you get much sharper text and beautifully defined images. We haven't seen this kind of visual clarity in VR before. It's awesome. And lastly, Oculus Go also ships with an integrated spatial audio experience. The audio drivers, oh yeah. The audio drivers are built right into the headset, so you, can't, you can use them without headphones if you want. It makes getting in and out of VR much faster and also much easier to share with another person. Gear VR and Oculus Go are binary compatible. Their apps are binary compatible, and they share the same controller input set. That means if you're building for Gear VR, you're also building for Oculus Go. And we're bringing the best of our library from Gear VR to Oculus Go on day one. Also, thanks to our amazing friends at Unity and Epic, you can now also build for Oculus Go in Unity and Universal Engine. 
we will start shipping Oculus Go dev kits to you, our developers, in November. All right, and that's Oculus Go, our first standalone VR headset. It's lightweight and comfortable, incredible visual quality, perfect for watching movies and concerts, playing games, and of course, just hanging out with your friends in VR. We believe Oculus Go will be the most accessible VR experience. You heard it from Mark. It'll be available early next year for $199. Awesome. Okay. So we've talked about mobile and standalone VR, and now I want to turn to our most powerful VR device, Oculus Rift. Rift pioneered VR magic to the world. And touch changed the game by giving us hand presence in VR with such high fidelity that you can naturally do things like throwing and catching a frisbee with, while flying, why not, in zero gravity, or holding a comic book in your hands and flipping through the pages just like the real thing, or scaling a cliff with your own hands, and then why not taking a quick break to check out the scenery. And so many other great experiences. Here's just a taste of what's possible in VR with Rift and Touch. When you commit to a path, I guess you are on your own. Follow your dreams to a place, a space, the grace that takes you home. But let me tell you. Thanks to the amazing developer community right here, our Rift catalog today features over 300 super high quality touch titles, including AAA blockbusters like Lone Echo, Robo Recall, and Arctica One, which just launched yesterday. We have a bunch of Rift announcements for you today. First of all, in response to the feedback that we received from a lot of you in our developer community, we're launching a new program called Oculus for Business. This program is designed for developers, small business owners, and enterprises, basically for companies who want to explore VR to create new workflows or completely change how they serve their customers. We're kicking off this program with a new Oculus Rift bundle. The bundle includes Rift and Touch, as well as an extra sensor for room scale VR and extra facial interfaces. You also get a full VR commercial license, enterprise grade warranty, and dedicated customer support. Plus, businesses can now place bulk orders. <clears throat> the 
Now, we've already been working with a few leading companies around the world who have been pioneers of VR in awesome new ways. Um, here are some great examples. Audi. Audi is installing Rift in hundreds of their dealerships worldwide. They're allowing potential customers to try different configurations of their dream car, like the awesome R8 Spider right here. And you do that while experiencing the car in an immersive new way, which is so much better than even the best web configuration tool. It's really, really awesome. And of course, love the car. Cisco. Cisco created the VR collaboration environment on top of their Spark platform that lets coworkers meet in real time to work together, or in this particular case, play around with 3D jet engines. Why not? And that's definitely not all. Here are many more of these global leaders that are working with this developer community right now to bring VR into their businesses. It's great to see VR continue to expand so quickly across an impressive range of industries. If you want to learn more, check out our website. All right. This past July, we launched the Summer of Rift promotion, and it, we ran it for a few weeks. It was a huge success, and the Rift community grew a lot. Now check this out. We're making a bold move. We're setting a new permanent price for Oculus Rift and Touch. Starting today, Rift and Touch will be available for $3.99. The best VR system, now at the best price, period. And we have even more exciting news to share with you about Rift later this morning. Now, since the beginning of this journey, we've been asking ourselves, would it be possible to one day get the magic of Rift into a portable, fully untethered VR device? Could we deliver the magic of Rift without a PC? Well, let's talk about the future. That question I just asked is what originally kicked off the Santa Cruz project. And last year, right at Oculus Connect, we demoed the first generation Santa Cruz prototype. It was an early prototype. It had a full mobile computer strapped to the back of your head. So not quite a super ergonomic masterpiece. But it gave us a powerful platform to build and demonstrate a standalone VR headset with inside out tracking. It's hard to explain, but the feeling that you get when you're completely untethered is this overwhelming sense of freedom in VR. Now, the second you have that freedom of movement, you really want to walk up to everything and interact with it. You really want your hands in VR. You want that magic and freedom that you get with touch. So the next step with Santa Cruz was to build an amazing controller. And that's what we did. The same award-winning team that created Touched designed the Santa Cruz controllers. And you're going to love these. We carried over the features that made Touch so successful. You have both grip and trigger buttons, and the ergonomics that make these controllers disappear in your hands. Also, we designed the Santa Cruz controllers with a touchpad, which is very intuitive to users and gives developers more flexibility to create great experiences in this new category. Now, these are still prototypes, but they already look incredible and feel great in your hands. And I promise you'll get to try them before too long. So let's take a look at how the Santa Cruz controllers work. We use the same constellation tracking technology that we developed for Rift and Touch using these tiny LEDs. We, of course, want the controllers to sort of discreetly fade away into the background. So we built our tracking system with infrared LEDs that are not visible to the human eye, but they are visible to the sensors. 
I'm sure you already noticed the Santa Cruz controllers look different from touch. The tracking ring is in a totally different position. Well, that's because Santa Cruz tracks the controllers using the same sensors that enable inside-out tracking of the headset. And we specifically decided to use four ultra-wide angle sensors here and place them strategically to maximize tracking coverage. The top sensors in particular are placed very close to the edges and they're pointed slightly backwards so they can see when the controller is above your head. And by the way, we also tried a system with just two sensors in the earlier phases of this project, and we found that it was really limiting. You can see that here. Tracking controllers with just your visual field of view in VR really restricts the experience, and especially what you can do with your hands. Now, here's how this looks when you go to four sensors. You get a much wider tracking volume more natural and unrestricted movement with your hands. Now, what's really cool is to see this in action. With this four sensor tracking architecture, something as simple as picking up an object and throwing it becomes delightful. You can see how smooth the tracking is from every angle here. And from here, you can imagine actions like, you know, a tennis serve or, you know, bow and arrow or a quick draw. It gives you just a really good idea for the incredible freedom of movement that Santa Cruz can deliver. I want to show you a sneak preview here of what happens when you add awesome content and it all comes together. By the way, that was Bogo. She's our adorable mascot for Santa Cruz. Still learning her way around, but you'll get to meet her soon. Thanks, Bogo. Okay, we have more work to do as we build the next generation of standalone VR technology with Santa Cruz. But we're planning to put this in the hands of developers next year, as Mark said. After all, it's your work and your creativity that always deliver the real magic. So that's what I wanted to cover today from our hardware roadmap. There's a bunch of things we're really excited about here. Number one, Gear VR continues to lead the mobile VR category. Number two, delivering our first standalone VR device, Oculus Go, super comfortable and easy to wear, the best visual clarity you've seen in VR, and a very accessible price that will bring more and more people into this community. Number three, a new milestone for our industry with Santa Cruz. The first complete standalone VR system with full inside-out tracking and hand presence. And number four, Oculus Rift, now permanently available at $399 the best VR system, now at the best price, end of story. <laughs> now we get to talk about software. We've been working on some really cool updates to the Rift platform, and to share that with all of you now, please welcome Nate Mitchell. Good morning. At Oculus, we believe VR is a fundamentally new computing platform, one that we'll use every day to work, play, and connect. As Hugo mentioned, we're constantly pushing forward in hardware. But this morning, I'm excited to share more about how we're also realizing this future through software. 
Over the past year, we've rebuilt Rift's core software experience from the ground up to lay the foundation for the future of VR computing. We call it Rift Core 2.0, and it's the biggest update to Rift yet. <laughs> core 2.0 makes Rift more powerful, more intuitive, and more personal. Today, I want to introduce two of the most important new systems in the Core 2.0 update. We've been looking forward to sharing with these with you for a very long time, so let's dive right in. First, we've taken all the functionality that was in Universal Menu and Oculus Home, and we've replaced it with a brand new system interface designed specifically for touch. I'm excited to introduce your new command center for Rift, Oculus Dash. So Dash puts the power of Rift at your fingertips. Everything you need is available in Dash. Your apps and games, your friends, settings, and notifications too. You can bring up Dash anytime, anywhere. We've made it instantly accessible. And it runs as a 3D overlay, so it opens inside your current experience. There's no need to go back to home. You just open up Dash where you are. And where the old UI was designed for gamepad, we've designed Dash natively for touch. You can just swipe naturally to scroll, and once you've found what you're looking for, you simply tap to select it. It feels great. Dash completely streamlines complex actions. I can easily jump from one app to another directly from Dash. Or let's say Hugo invites me to play some rec room. I can open up Dash, accept the invite, and we're off. But that's just scratching the surface of what Dash is capable of. And that's because Dash unlocks the full power of your PC, letting you use your desktop apps from inside VR. This is a total game changer. Imagine I'm jumping across the galaxy in Elite Dangerous, and I want to check out the latest music video from Odessa. With Dash, I can take the video in Chrome, pin it to the side, and it stays there permanently as a 3D overlay inside my cockpit. The possibilities here for multitasking with your PC are endless. You can check the, the latest news in a web browser. You could set the perfect playlist in Spotify or even stay in touch with friends over Messenger. And as you can see, this is more than just a mirror of your physical monitor. Your workspace here is infinite. Every application can have its own virtual display, and they can be positioned anywhere at the right size and scale for VR. These are true virtual displays, enabled at a hardware level on the GPU, with best-in-class performance and visual quality, using the same underlying technology that we use for asynchronous space warp. And as hardware improves and resolutions get better, we're now on a path to replacing traditional monitors entirely. It took a huge amount of work under the hood to get this right. A big thank you to our friends at NVIDIA and AMD for all their support. <laughs> Internally, our teams are already getting a ton of benefit from having access to their traditional development tools inside VR. We actually use Dash with Visual Studio to debug Dash from inside Dash. That is as awesome as it sounds. <laughs> and these same workflows work with Unreal and Unity, too. Now, Dash is built using React VR, our open source framework for VR UI. This makes Dash super extensible, and we're really looking forward to working with the developer community to add more to Dash in the future. So that's Dash. 
Altogether, Dash is a massive step forward for the workspace of the future and VR computing. This is groundbreaking technology that you won't find anywhere else, and we're thrilled to enable it first on Rift. Now, the next major highlight of Core 2.0 is Oculus Home. This is what Home looks like today. One of the most requested features for Rift has always been the ability to create and customize your own space. And with Dash taking on more of the platform UI, Home's freed up to be more personal and more immersive. So we leveled home and rebuilt it. Let's check it out. is now yours to customize and explore. Creating and designing your own space is easy. Everyone starts with a great collection of items to create a space that feels totally unique. We have furniture, toys, even works of art. And you can place these items anywhere in the room using touch. They just snap into place super easily. And of course, you can mess with reality a bit too. Now there are a bunch of fun new features inside Home. Your achievements can be put up on display for your friends to come check out. And your collection of apps actually comes to life as old school cartridges that can be launched from inside Home. You can even play with fireworks or practice your aim from the safety of your virtual living room. We also wanted Home to deliver an even greater level of presence. Now, Home has a much more realistic and vibrant look, with state-of-the-art lighting and dynamic soft shadows powered by Unreal Engine 4. And it looks absolutely stunning in Rift. Finally, your space is now completely persistent. You can share it with friends or visit your friends' spaces to see what they've created. You can even leave your friends a note for the next time they log in. This initial update to Home is really focused on customization, but we're going to be making it easy for you and your friends to hang out in Home and even create shared spaces together in the future. So, that's a quick preview of Rift Core 2.0. I'm excited to announce that Rift Core 2.0, the beta, will be available this December as a free update to all Rift users. When it comes to Rift, we are really just getting started. Home and Dash are both fundamental parts of our vision for the future of VR computing. And we're looking forward to sharing much more with you in the year ahead. Thanks so much. Wow, that rocked. Now it's time to dive into the developer section of this keynote as you can see here. Today, we get to bring the entire community together to celebrate how far we've come. The number of developers building for Oculus has doubled in the past year. And together, you shipped over 2,000 apps and experiences. You can see a couple of them here. We have some great developer announcements and a few surprises for you today. And over the next two days, we'll talk about your app performance, supercharging discovery, creating safe communities in VR, and a lot more. Our next speaker is an Oculus OG who's had a big hand in growing many of our product teams from the beginning. She PM'd the very first version of Oculus Home with exactly 2.6 engineers and every version of Home since then, among many other awesome things. Please welcome product manager Christina Womack to the stage. Woo! <laughs> 
<laughs> Hi everyone. This may be the biggest connect, but I know many of you have been with us since the very first one. I didn't make it to that one. I was in Irvine with my team, frantically trying to get Oculus Home ready so Gear VR could ship. So I feel like we've all been in the trenches together for a really long time now. So much has changed since we shipped DK1, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to this industry and to our developer community. Today, I'd like to take a moment to answer the questions we hear from you time and again. How are we helping you to develop? And how are we helping you reach people? This is how we think about supporting your work. Let's dive right in. I don't need to tell most of the people in this room this, but it bears acknowledging that building for VR is super demanding. You have to hit standards in software development that have never existed before. So every time we find an opportunity to take the pressure off, we're going to do it. Here's just some of what we've shipped for the past year. Most of these are so you can find problems earlier and fix them faster. Take Lost Frame Capture, shipping this week. It's in the Oculus Debug tool, and with it, you don't have to wait for our Rift store team to tell you that you're dropping frames. This is what we use to evaluate apps, and we're giving it to you. So you can find exactly where you're dropping them and fix before you submit. And while we're on performance, we know, my team knows, the nemesis of VR development can be the CPU. So let's take a look at multi-view. Unity developers know this as single-pass stereo rendering. It's an extension to OpenGL ES that can lower the CPU cost of draw calls by up to 40%, helping you hit frame rate and giving you room for more complex and creative scenes. It's not new. We've talked about it before. But it's taken years to change the standard and get the chips in the devices with the right drivers and get engines and SDKs updated ready for you to use. This was a four-year marathon across the industry with all of these partners, and it's finally ready for prime time. This is a scene being drawn without multi-view and with multi-view. You can see multi-view finishes faster, and this is all done automatically behind the scenes for you. Illustrative videos are great, but what about a real game? This is Republic. The camouflage team has been hard at work bringing this from mobile and console to VR. This game would not be possible in mobile VR without multi-view. Camouflage told us they got as much as a 30% boost to frame rate with it enabled. And now I'm super excited to announce it's coming soon to Gear VR. <laughs> but great VR isn't all about frame time. We at Oculus just don't want you to have to build everything yourselves. We want to give you building blocks as shortcuts. When I ask people what their most memorable experience has been in VR, often they say it was when they were with their best friend or a family member. That's why you hear about people's first experiences. That's why we want to give you a whole pile of blocks for building great social apps. Our Oculus avatars debuted last year and they showed up in some super fun apps like Kingspray and Brass Tactics. We are still working on the best ways for people to express themselves in VR. We've learned a lot through research and play. Today, I'm super excited to announce you and to introduce you to the new, brand new Oculus avatars. This is a brand new visual style that gives people more ways to customize skin, clothing, and hair color independently. Some of us in the team have a vested interest in unusual hair color. <laughs> with this update, we're giving people trillions of permutations. And with the redesign, we're also adding the ability for people to unlock custom avatar clothing and accessories that you create to match your game or app. 
For example, this is an awesome skin we're making available for people to celebrate Res Infinite coming to Oculus. Our new avatars are coming to Rift and Mobile in 2018. And we've heard you. Finally, I'm very excited to announce that your most requested avatars feature is on its way. You'll be able to take Oculus avatars to other platforms, including Steam and Daydream, in 2018. Our new direction is about more than just representation, and we're still iterating. To give you a sneak preview of what's coming later next year, Please meet my friend and the 0.6 engineer you heard about when Hugo introduced me, who helped us build the first version of Oculus Home, Will Steptoe. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here at OC4. I wanted to show you how we're updating Oculus avatars to be more dynamic and expressive. Our new skin shading makes for a more realistic look, and our new clothing options help you personalize to your own style. We're also adding real-time mouth movement, driven by our lip sync library. And we've worked hard to make the eyes feel true to human behavior. They'll identify and track interesting objects in the scene around you. We really think that these changes make social experiences more fun and engaging. And we're excited to introduce them to you next year. Thank you very much. Now back to you, Christina. OK, avatars are one shortcut. VoIP and our Rooms APIs are others. And we wired these together into a social starter scene to make it even easier to get started building social apps. You can find this in the Developer Center. But we know this is only the beginning. Let's be honest. Being in VR with other people, especially strangers, can be intimidating. For communities to thrive, People need to feel safe, and it costs developers a lot of money and time and effort to build and maintain safe places. We care deeply about protecting the future of social VR, so we want to help. We decided to build an API that does a lot of it for you. So early next year, you'll be able to get platform-level safety tools, like blocking and reporting, for free. It's like built-in best practices that carry app to app. For example, if I block a person in app one, and we both happen to move to app two, I can still be protected. Whoever I blocked can be blocked everywhere. And the same API, <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> and the same API that powers that also lets people who have enjoyed playing together simply pull up the UI add a friend so they can play together again in future. These features all start rolling out in early 2018, and we'll add more as the year goes on. These are just a few of the things we're doing to help you develop, to get to the store faster and with better performance. Now, Hugo spoke earlier about how we're going to bring more people into VR, so let's answer that second question. How are we going to help you reach them? First, for everyone already in the headset, we're still making the store better. It's the first point of discovery for most people. Nate just introduced you to the new Oculus Home on Rift. And early next year, Rift will include an amazing new store. This is just a hint of what's to come. But discovering great content isn't limited to the store. In Home on Gear VR, we've introduced a new section called Explore. It's a feed of personalized recommendations. We're matching content to people. So if you're like my kids, and all you want to see is sharks and dinosaurs, that's what we'll show you. And if you spend time in horror and puzzle games, we'll show you more of those. Explore stories can come from us at Oculus when we need to tell you about promotions like bundles or to highlight trending apps and experiences, but they can also come from you. You can create developer stories right from the developer center. 
New York Times can use developer stories to deep link directly from Explore to specific videos inside their app. Face Your Fears can announce new doors and deep link right to those. You can use these to announce new content, features, levels, or game modes, which is especially awesome for getting news to people who already own your app, but maybe haven't launched it in a while. Also super useful for time-sensitive events like concerts, where we're trying to get people together in VR at a specific moment. And speaking of concerts, Samsung VR used an event to promote a Coldplay concert, and this is amazing. This blew my mind when the stat came in. Almost half of everyone in Gear VR at that moment jumped in to join the fun. Now, we're going to give you a new way to get your content into Explore. We're opening our Explore API to all developers on Gear VR today. And we're bringing Explore to Rift in 2018. But as you know, not everyone owns a headset yet. So for now, it's still super important for us to help increasing awareness of your work and really VR itself with people outside of VR too. And this is a multi-threaded effort for us. First, one of the ways we think we can help is to make it super easy for your app to be seen on Facebook. It's where your fans can become evangelists. So we've built hooks directly into the platform to make it easier. From inside your app, you can dream up all these creative ways to let people capture videos and stills and then call the brand new Share API to let people quickly and easily post to Facebook. Another great way to be found on Facebook is live streaming. We're already seeing people live streaming long VR sessions, visiting multiple apps, and starting today, Live streams on Gear VR will be more interactive, so I can see comments and reactions rolling in right over my app in VR. And we're going to bring live streaming to Rift next year. OK, so we've talked about discovery in the headset and on Facebook, but we think we can do something to bridge the gap in the middle, too. We're adding a feature to let me connect with my friends when they're in VR and check out the game they're playing wherever I may be. The Oculus app will notify me when a friend goes in to Gear VR. From the notification, I'll be able to ask to tune in. My friend can choose to accept. And when we're connected, I'll be watching a video stream, seeing what they see in VR, and we'll be chatting live. And if I have my headset nearby, I can jump in and join them. Bridging the gap is also super important for people who have never put on a headset, though. I don't know about you, but explaining VR to my parents without showing it to them was pretty difficult. So it stands to reason that marketing VR experiences outside of the headset is really hard. Mixed reality is a way for people to understand what your VR experience might feel like, even if they've never put on a headset. Here's our team working behind the scenes on a video for Dead and Buried. Our native stack makes it possible to combine real-world footage with in-game capture, including the dynamic lighting. Your video can then be used in live streams, gameplay trailers, or even at a live event. And here's an end result. This one shows the medium, medium team's mixed reality capture with artist Niall Smith at work. You can get started creating these videos in Unity and Unreal. And every developer in this room is paving the way for the future of VR. Your success is VR's success. Keep giving us feedback. Keep us honest. We're so excited that you're with us.
Okay, now I'd like to introduce you to one of your fellow developers and our good friend, whose team is leading the charge to bring the Facebook community to the Oculus platform and beyond. But before we welcome Rachel Franklin, head of social VR at Facebook, let's check out what her team has been working on. Testing one, two, three, four, five. We are live from the spaces. I'm really moving and I'm really talking and, and this is me. And I have a pizza in my hand. I got full dung fella <laughs> going on. What you're hearing right now is a virtual accent. This is a horrible star. The world's worst star. See these glasses? Ooh. Whoosh. I've got a selfie stick. It's so You just saw how virtual reality has the power to build communities by helping people feel like they're really together, even when they're actually very far apart. And VR also lets us share experiences that we couldn't otherwise have, but with people we care about. Now, just six months ago, we took our first step toward building VR with people at the center. Facebook Spaces is a place to be yourself with your friends and family, no matter where you are in the world. It's available for Rift, and it's coming to other platforms soon. Now, people are getting creative and having fun in spaces, from tic-tac-toe games to karaoke showdowns. And what this tells us is that putting people first in VR really works. There's something just incredibly wonderful that happens when you take people who care about each other and have them share fun activities and immersive content in VR. And we're continuing to build on that foundation in three ways. The first is that we need to bring people even more fun, engaging activities to share in VR. Second, we need to provide more immersive media for people to explore together in VR. And third, we need to connect people across virtual and non-virtual worlds so everyone can share immersive experiences from a headset, from their desktop, and even from their phone. So let's dive deeper on that first one, engaging activities. We started with a few core features and spaces, but everyone's idea of fun is personal. And who better to tell us how to make spaces even better than the people who are actually using it? So we're focused on building tools that give people the power to be creative, with their friends in VR. We've added a way for you to create your own toys and props from your Facebook photos, so you can make a 3D collage or even a mask. We've added dice, so you can easily challenge friends to your favorite games, like my personal favorite, craps. And playing cards are coming soon, too. OK, what's even better, though, is that we're introducing a new way for anyone in spaces to combine items so you can make your very own kit. And then you can save it and share it with friends. So maybe it's all the pieces of your favorite costume or the elements of a handcrafted board game. Kits are launching in the coming weeks, and we are really excited to see the creativity of our community. But that's just the beginning. As we continue to build on the core of Facebook Spaces, we know that all of you as developers will contribute ideas that we could never have imagined. So next year, we're going to open up new ways for you to build with us. Let me show you an early example from our collaboration with Resolution Games. They're the creators of the successful Gear VR game, Bait. So it lets you turn the Spaces table into a game where you can go ice fishing with your friends. 10 seconds left. Here we go. OK. Yeah. Oh. Woo. Nice one. Woo-hoo. Oh. Nice. <laughs> and you can try this on the show floor today in a demo. But it's not only fun. It's actually a really clever way to adapt the space's environment for a totally different purpose. 
And these are experiments that help us learn how to build in this new product. We learn what works, we learn what doesn't, and we learn what tools will empower developers to bring their great ideas to life. We'll share more specifics with you guys on our plans for next year, but in the meantime, please let us know if you're interested because we do want to hear from you. Now, it's not just creative activities that bring people together. It's meaningful media, too. And there's a huge opportunity for artists and filmmakers and visionaries to bring their creations to people in VR. So let's talk about a few ways that we're going to enable that. This year, Live360 Video has opened an immersive window into new experiences right from the Facebook app. With Live360 Videos produced by many of you, people are exploring new places and experiencing moments from the personal to the incredible as they unfold. We got a local's view of some awesome spots from one of my favorite creators, Ariel Vieira, and he gives these Live360 walking tours of New York. Now, funny enough, what's showing up here is actually called the Oculus. I thought that was very cool. <laughs> we got a close-up 360 view of the red carpet at a movie premiere as all the stars arrived. Now, this is something that most of us could never be a part of. But with VR, we can take these experiences to the next level. We can actually be there posing for the paparazzi on that red carpet. And we can do it with our friends. So today, I'm excited to announce that Live 360 video is coming to Facebook Spaces. This means that you can stream full 360 video into your space, letting you be anywhere in the world with your friends in real time. And you'll have the full wealth of Facebook Live 360 content at your fingertips in VR, so you can experience places and moments in an entirely new way together. It's the first step toward true telepresence, and it's rolling out later this year. Today, we're doing an early demo, so if you're not able to be with us here at OC4, you can jump into spaces and you will find a live 360 video that puts you right on the show floor. So you can join us from wherever you are with your friends. Now, as 360 video becomes a new medium for creative expression, there are also artists around the world that are pioneering this new form of media that's created from inside VR. They're embracing tools like Quill, a simple but powerful app where artists make unique VR-native works of art that you don't just look at, you're actually immersed in them. And these stunning experiences can leave a powerful emotional impression. In fact, the one you're seeing right now was nominated for an Emmy. As with all art, people naturally want to share it with someone else. But up till now, that hasn't been possible. Today, we're announcing that Quill Art, or as we like to call them, Quillistrations, are coming to Facebook Spaces. This lets us amplify the power of the VR native art form to not only evoke powerful feelings in all of us, but also to connect with others at the same time. We're starting with a beautiful VR animated short story painted in Quill by our incredibly talented resident artist, Goro Fujita. Now, you can experience this story in spaces on the show floor today. I would encourage you to do it. It's really beautiful. And it'll be rolling out to everyone soon. And then next year, we'll open it up for any Quill artist to be able to publish their work in spaces as well. This is the beginning of a future where people can meet up, 
with their friends to watch stories and shows and movies created specifically for VR. And anyone can create them, from a college student to a professional student, or sorry, a professional studio, whether they're working in Quill or any other 3D platform. And it's a brand new way to share art with each other like never before. So this brings me to the third piece of the puzzle I shared uh, with you earlier, connecting people across virtual and non-virtual worlds. With all of this powerful content being created within VR, we're seeing the beginnings of an ecosystem take shape. We're seeing talented artists emerge, and they use tools like Oculus Medium to create new kinds of virtual content. But why should all that content be confined to VR? We want to allow creators to distribute their immersive content beyond the boundary of the headset so that people can discover and share immersive experiences with all of their friends, no matter where they are. By linking virtual platforms to the Facebook platform, we can make this possible. Starting today, objects created in VR can be shared in a new, more engaging way with a completely native 3D media type in your news feed. Introducing the Facebook 3D post. It's interactive, and it's immediately responsive to scroll and touch. It makes content pop off the screen. And you can do this today with anything that you create from medium or marker drawings from spaces. Now, these posts use a standard 3D format. So soon, we're going to be widening support for even more 3D creation tools. And we plan to open up an API for any developer to share 3D posts from your app to Facebook. So not only can you share these creations from VR to Facebook, you can actually move them in and out of VR seamlessly. And this is really cool. Since Spaces gives you access to all of your Facebook content, any piece of medium art on Facebook can now become a virtual object in Facebook Spaces. And soon there'll be more ways to apply this technology. For instance, you could take a VR sculpture into AR and create an AR object using the Facebook camera, and then bring that object into your real-world environment. Very cool. <laughs> we'll also be able to create fully interactive 3D scenes for people to discover on Facebook, like this one. So you can see how the objects are animated, and you can even open the door by just scrolling your finger. It is so fun. And we can't wait to open this up to more 3D content types so all VR creators can share their work in brand new ways. We're working toward a world where everyone can share their immersive experiences seamlessly, and everyone can contribute their creativity. That's what's awesome about Facebook. People and developers and professional creators all coming together in communities, sharing meaningful moments and impactful experiences with each other. But now, with a whole new dimension. Thank you. All right. 2017 was a blockbuster year for VR content. And you brought home awards and accolades, including six Emmy nominations, and of course, Echo Arena winning E3 VR Game of the Year. It's awesome. Last year, we announced we were doubling our original investment of 250 million to fund VR content, and our dedication to this community isn't slowing down. We're bringing more and more big name developers and publishers into the game. In just a minute, Oculus VP of content, Jason Rubin, is going to join us on stage and share with you some of the brand new experiences, AAA experiences, coming to Oculus. But first, let's take a moment to celebrate the insane things that we accomplished together this year.
At the beginning of 2017, we said this is going to be the year of content, but you exceeded our wildest imagination. The number of great titles you've brought to our platform this year is staggering. Now let's take a minute and level set. Gear VR is about two years old. Rift is 18 months old. Touch, believe it or not, has not yet celebrated its first birthday. And before these amazing pieces of hardware were on the horizon, there just wasn't that much VR development going on. If someone had told me two years ago that as a community, these were our goals, I would have said, yeah, right. We can achieve one of them, maybe. You know what? You achieved all four. <laughs> now, we've become impatient as a society. We expect things to happen overnight, but that's not the way change happens. The road to mass adoption in VR is going to take a while, but if this Last two years is any indication, we're well on our way. How many of you have ever been inside the White House? Okay, a few. How many of you have ever been in orbit? I didn't think so. <laughs> How about in front of a dinosaur? Not likely, right? Well, if you're in VR, you can do any of these things in an hour. And importantly, the diversity, quality, and immersiveness of these experiences is just going to get better. Felix and Paul won an Emmy by bringing us inside the White House for People's House. It's amazing. And it's the promise of their films that makes us true VR believers. Let's talk about Onward for a second. Onward is an amazing first-person shooter, but what's really incredible is it was developed by one individual in one year, he's self-taught, and this is his first game. While Oculus was fo focusing on comfort, teleportation. Dante said, to heck with that. Went with old school first person controls. You know what? He found a willing audience. That's awesome, Dante. Thank you. <laughs> We're extremely proud to announce that Onward is coming to the Rift in the next month. <laughs> Indie developers are vitally important to VR. Their creativity, and often risk-taking, pushes the medium forward. And indie developers like Dante keep us on the edge of our seats, waiting to see what's next. Face Your Fears is one of our biggest success stories. It's been downloaded over a million and a half times. If you go to YouTube, you can see tons of hilarious videos, brothers and sisters and grandmothers facing their fears. It's easy to understand why this is a mega hit. How many of you are fans of Netflix's Stranger Things? I figured. Well, we're going to mash these two IP together into a new fear that's coming in the next month. Allowing fans to step into their favorite TV shows and movies brings tears to people's eyes. If any of you have been to Comic-Con recently and seen the lines for our activations, you know what I'm talking about. VR's potential for wish fulfillment is limitless. Which brings us to Lone Echo from Ready at Dawn. Two years ago, there was no such thing as a made-for-VR genre. There were no best practices. Nobody had ever tried to figure out how to wrap a hand around an arbitrary shape. You know, we've been here before. I remember 20-some-odd years ago trying to figure out how to get a character action game into 3D. In retrospect, it seems like it should have been easy. But at the time, it was really hard work. You guys are doing really hard work. Well, hard work pays off. Lone Echo is our fastest title to a million dollars, and it's still going really strong. And yes, they scored an 89 on Metacritic. Why is this important? 
in the 20 some odd years of Metacritic data, Lone Echo is one of the top 150 titles on PC. 2D, 3D, anything. And when VR is just getting started, we're going to double down on that potential. I'm really excited to announce that Ready at Dawn is going to be releasing a major expansion to Echo Arena next year. <laughs> Echo Combat is a new multiplayer, zero gravity, first person shooter expansion to Echo Arena. I'll be seeing you in there. And Ready at Dawn has also let me say, after a lot of pushing, Jack and Liv's story will continue. There's more to Lone Echo coming. Wait for a big announcement shortly. So yeah, we're incredibly proud of the reception that Lone Echo and Echo Arena have gotten. The most common thread in reviews is that these are experiences like no other. We fundamentally believe that VR will continue to, I'm sorry, continue to deliver experiences like no other. What VR has that differentiates it from every other technology that it keeps getting compared to is infinite potential. And we believe in you, and we believe in your ability to unlock that potential. Now, as has become customary, we'd like to show you a few videos of just a sample of some of the things that are coming out in the next year. Watch this. Wow! <laughs> so dope. You did good! Let's do it all again! Acolyte, it's your time to fight alone. Unlock the secrets. Channel your energies and become ascendant. Join us and become one of the unspoken. I've never met a Blade Runner before. Welcome to your memory. Something's wrong. You're in a different memory. Don't worry. We made you. We'll take care of you. So yeah, 2017 has been the year of content. And it isn't over yet. We just released Arctica 1 yesterday, and we have a lot of fantastic titles coming before the end of the year. But as you can see, 2018 is the year of infinite potential. We believe that it's going to reach even greater heights. Now, before I leave, there's a question that I keep getting asked over and over again. When are the biggest developers and publishers coming to VR? And every time, I answer it in the same way. Be patient, they're coming. Well, today, 
I'm extremely excited to make a down payment on that promise. Oculus is honored to be working with one of the greatest developers in video game history. Thank you. You go from knowing you're dead by noon to I'm gonna live and I'm not even wounded in a matter of a few hours. It's like no feeling you've ever had before. War and combat have been part of human civilization since the beginning. People have a fascination for what it must be like. Putting your life on the line for something bigger is a universal appeal. At Respawn, it's about creating an authentic experience. We really want to depict being a soldier in combat in a more fully fleshed out and realistic way. In the Titanfall games, it was about evolving the combat now, not just on the ground, looking left and right and worrying about flanking. You have to worry about what's above you. It makes you think differently. A combat experience in VR really gives you the chance to experience life closer to what a soldier would experience in real combat. It gives you more of that feeling of paranoia and, and the tension. Fear and adrenaline and anger. It's more visceral, it's more terrifying. VR puts you into those situations so you can start imagining a small part of what it must be like. Right now we're just getting started. The drive to create this new VR experience was so great that it was a natural fit for us to partner with Oculus. They believe in the vision. They believe in what we're doing. We won't be satisfied until we're working on a game that is going to have an impact on the industry. I think together we're gonna make something really remarkable. I could tell you in words, but really, you have to be here. Thanks, Jason. I loved how you just dropped the mic right there. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We've covered a lot of ground this morning. Mark shared his vision of the power of VR to collapse distance. We introduced you to Oculus Go, launching early next year, and gave you a glimpse at the future of standalone VR with Project Santa Cruz. You saw the new Oculus Home and Dash and our evolving suite of developer tools, plus awesome new content partners, including the mashup of Stranger Things and Face Your Fears, and Pixar and Respawn jumping into VR for the very first time. You've seen how far VR has come in the past year, and that's just the tip of the OC4 iceberg. Over the next two days, you'll hear from developers, artists, filmmakers, engineers, and astronauts, why not, covering design, development, distribution, and the future of our industry. I can't wait to experience my first Oculus Connect. But before we all hit the show floor, we have one more treat for you today. Up in Washington State, the team at Oculus Research is hard at work exploring the unknown and taking our next steps into the far future of VR. They're working on bleeding edge optics, haptics, computer vision, applied machine learning, and this, a one-of-a-kind multifocal perceptual test bed designed to better understand new display technologies. Traditionally, Oculus chief scientist Michael Abrash closes the Connect keynote with a little magic on stage. This year, we're going to do things differently. Michael will be joined on stage by critically acclaimed journalist slash VR enthusiast Stephen Levy, for a chat about the future of immersive computing. You might recognize Stephen from Back Channel, Wired, and yes, the whole Earth software catalog. I'm excited to see what comes from this conversation between two of the most vibrant minds in the industry. And with that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Michael and Stephen to the stage. Well, thank you. 
Um, as Hugo said, uh, a highlight of previous uh, Oculus Connects and F8s have been Michael's talk, so I am so honored to be uh, speaking with him up here. Uh, I was also backstage with him when Mark said that a billion people were going to be in virtual reality. It was the first time Michael heard that, and uh, no pressure. <laughs> in, 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 he didn't say when. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, right after this talk, you're going to publish uh, an article on the blog, the Oculus blog, uh, revealing a little bit of what's happening up there in Redmond, Washington, uh, with your fairly secretive lab uh, that's you know, looking at the, the, and trying to make happen the far future of, of virtual reality there. And you compare it to Xerox Park in probably the early 60s, when they were coming up with the conventions of computing as, as we know it now. Uh, tell me, what, what made you come up with that comparison? What part of Park are you thinking about, and where does that comparison lie? Well, in the 70s, what happened at Park, particularly in the computer sciences lab, was that there was this amazing critical mass of people, many of whom are now famous, like, for example, Alan Kay or Chuck Thacker or Butler Lamson. But people came together and brought all these pieces into a platform that is the platform we use today. So laser printers, ethernet, bitmapped graphics, windowing, WYSIWYG word processing, this whole package. And really, for the last 40 years, we've all been using that platform and elaborating on it. And I do wonder sometimes, if those people hadn't come together in that place, how different our world might be right now. Would you be sitting here with an iPad? I don't know. <laughs> So, so I'm sitting with Dynabook. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> um, so the, um, the thing is, that was really the first great wave of human-oriented computing. And we all take it for granted now that everybody in this audience is seconds away from the virtual world, effectively. And you can look at it through this nice, flat, two-dimensional surface. You can interact with it. That's how we all have gotten used to it. And that's great. But what VR is, is it's the second great wave. It's the wave in which instead of looking at it through these portals, we actually just live in it. And to do that, we're going to need another critical mass of people, very similar to Xerox Park, covering a whole range of things, right? Computer vision, optics, audio, um, interaction. All these pieces have to come together into that platform that will let us be really in that digital world. And I've said this before, the thing I want is I want a virtual workspace where I can just put on the headset and I can have whatever configurations I want, switch between them, teleport to see people. And that is going to be that second great wave. And that's what we're trying to put together. Well, in, in order to do that, just as they came up with you know, the, these tropes and conventions that enabled us to communicate with computers better than typing in a command line there, you know, there's no, going to be no keyboards. You know, and, you know, the, uh, we're going to be immersed in this reality there. We're going to need new conventions and, and new kinds of interfaces. I know you're you know, like a big admirer of what Doug Engelbart did. He was the, the man who really came up with his team of you know, uh, the tools we use, like the mouse and Windows and uh, you know, de the desktop you know, in order to do this. So what... what when you think about what these conventions will be in virtual reality, you know, what, what do you think and how do you come up with conventions that are going to allow us to you know, move around and you know, can accomplish things in this new platform? I think we are at an Engelbart moment. What I think is interesting this time, instead of one person with a specific vision, what we have is we have all these people. And everybody here, in one way or another, is running that experiment of how do we interact with the virtual world when we're immersed in it. Um, and one of the places I see that that I think is great is how do you move without having discomfort, right? And I've seen many, many different approaches. I'm hypersensitive to that. And it's amazing how much better that has gotten over the last year. And it's really because we're running all these experiments. So I think that what it's going to be is that's going to be the community. You're like, can you drill down on that? Why, why is it easier to move this year than, than it was last year? Uh, there are just more people in it, and they've built up that knowledge base. One of the things that um, it's hard for all us um, technical people to realize is that the world is too complex to deduce everything, and you really have to run a lot of experiments. And what's happening is we're running more and more experiments. The community is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and how, you know, uh, you know, the Xerox Park, you know, it, it's sort of a dangerous analogy to make. Because on one hand, they did amazing work. On the other hand, it's notorious 
for not really delivering all the value that they created to the company that paid the bills. And that's, that's interesting, and I would say that's a question I get asked every single time I use the phrase Xerox <laughs> Park. And what's your answer? Well, my answer is that really, if you look at it, it's hard to see how it could have worked. Xerox had a business that would have been undercut by the technology from Xerox Park, and in fact, it was ultimately. Um, and there was this misalignment where they created this lab, the lab did great work, the work didn't really fit with their business. So different here, because it is incredibly clear, even, you know, even today, you look at Facebook spaces, for example, and you say how well VR matches Facebook's mission to connect the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I think VR ultimately will be the most social thing that effectively has ever happened, because now space doesn't limit who you can, can, can connect with. So this is something, as everybody saw today, that Mark really believes in, and it fits tightly, and so all it is is a matter of delivering that, and it will f fit beautifully. That's interesting, because I was going to ask you how much, you know, as opposed to just a, you know, like a, a raw research lab, um, a research lab really owned by Facebook shaped the research. And it seems to me, uh, whether it's you're just a natural sync with, with, with Mark's vision and Facebook's mission uh, or, or not, that, that seems to be a direction you're going in, in all the research. So it is a natural sync, though. I think, I think it's obvious to pretty much everyone here when you look at what VR is now and what VR could be, the different ways in which you want to see it move forward, right? You want better visual quality. You want the ability to move around freely. You want the ability to mix the real and virtual world. And all those things fit well with what Facebook is doing. So I know one thing, and I, I think you talked about this at a previous keynote, that one thing you have a vision of and you saw sketches of it are you know, a, a very lightweight way to project reality on, onto our senses, like glasses there. And you're not alone in, in this. Maybe you know, Oculus was a, a, a little ahead uh, in the competition among the bigger companies there. But right now, uh, we know that you know, obviously Google and and, and Amazon and uh, Apple, you know, other players, Magic Leap, Snap, they're, they're all looking at, at, at the same thing. Do you think this is going to be sort of the alpha competition of the 2020s? Who's able to come up with like a, a lightweight, like glasses, uh, way of projecting virtual reality or augmented reality on, on, on people? And, you know, the, with the, the winner goes the spoils? I, what I would say is it's obvious to me that this is the next platform. And... I think it's obvious to a lot of people, and I think it's going to be a very exciting future doing it, and I think we're incredibly well positioned. But what I'm really thinking is, I can't wait to get to that future. So in your writings and in, in, in your, when, you, when you talk, uh, you talk a lot about um, a vision where there'll be a persistence to what, what we have there. We're, uh, it, it won't be something we use just for a couple minutes a day, but will be part of our daily existence there. Um, how, how important is that to have, to develop something that's going to be a, a routine part of our lives as opposed to you know, a special experience? Well, I, I think that when you talk about something being a next platform, the key is that it's something that is an important part of our life. How much of the time isn't really the key. The key is that it's something that every day you'll think, yeah, I'm just going to do this as a matter of course. So trying to think of the last time that I didn't look at my phone for a whole day, and I huh. think it's been a very long time. Mm -hmm. and the last time I didn't look at a computer. And really, this is, this is going to be a primary way that we interact with what we do for work, for play, for how we connect with other people. And what are the challenges in, in making that happen? You know, maybe, maybe just start, you know, talking about the, the idea of, of, like, persistence. You know, in order to, you know, have something that, that's, you know, uh, going to be, be comfortable, you know, I think earlier in the keynote, someone alluded to, you know, these headsets, as great as they are, you know, are going to, going to be evolved. It's up to you uh, and your team to, to evolve them. What do you, what do you, how do you do that? And there are so many ways that it does need to evolve to actually fulfill that potential. I mean, there's magic there now, but I think everybody in this room would love to see super high resolution with really good focus at all depths, with a field of view as wide as the human field of view. They would love to be able to bring in real world things like desks, keyboards, other people, move around freely. 
Um, and they'd love to be able to interact with things in a more natural, fluid way. And everybody sees that in the long run, the limit is can we do something that starts to rival our real experiences. So I think we're just at the beginning of a very, very long path that's going to be very exciting. Well, and so in, in, in doing that, what, what kind of people are you looking for? You know, who, who, who works at uh, Oculus Research? So first of all, it helps if they're really smart. Um, but I don't think that's going to surprise you're anybody. You're not looking for dumb people, is that what you're saying? We, we are not. Okay. Um, <laughs> so thank you for, for helping limit I'm that out. one. <laughs> um, but there's much more to it than that. One of the things is that there, virtual reality is so, so technologically challenging and has so many different parts that have to work together that there's nothing that one person by themselves can really move forward enough. It's really a team effort. So they have to be team players where they have skills that are complementary to the other people. And um, they also have to be very comfortable with working in an environment that's uncertain. Because all of this is unexplored territory, and it's going to be explored, but that process means there are inevitably going to be a lot of experiments that fail, and a lot of experiments that succeed, and a lot of rerouting as it goes along. And so, People who would want to just be told, here, do this thing, and this is what you need to do and not think about it, probably not the right place. What you want is someone who's a full part of the team who's always thinking about how do we succeed overall, thinking about the big picture, thinking about how all the pieces fit together. And, you know, uh, so you talk about some of the you know, specific directions you're doing. You know, you said before in, in one of your talks about, you know, we need some scientific breakthroughs that aren't here yet in order to really bring a... a, a to realize you know, what, what you think that uh, this platform should be. You know, so I know you're not going to give us any trade secrets, but, but maybe talk about some directions you're going there that uh, bring us closer to that vision. So I'll talk about one specific thing, which I think everybody here could identify with, which is how do we get so that you can have really sharp visual clarity all the time? And right now, the headsets have fixed lenses that focus you at two meters. And that means that everything closer than one meter is really not as sharp as it could be. And as resolutions go up and as optics improve, that will become more and more apparent. And obviously, especially if you can start bringing the real world, you want to do things within arm's length. So there are a number of ways that that could possibly be addressed. So for example, the ultimate solution would probably be holography. If you could have glasses that gave you a holographic image, it would be an awful lot like seeing the real world. Another approach would be to have a very, very um, fine lens, uh, uh, array of fine lenses that can create a light field that approximates reality. Another way to do it would be to have multiple planes, each one at a different depth. And yet another way would be to change the focal depth to match where you're looking. All these are possible solutions. The problem is none of them are workable product solutions yet. Hmm. So those are all interesting directions to go in, and they're partly research, and they're partly thinking about how they could be engineered. Um, and every one of them is difficult, but every one of them is, is potentially a solution. So in other words, you, know, you listed about probably a half dozen approaches there. Are you working on like, every single one of those and, and experimenting in those? I would say that at, at some level, we're working with each of them. Um, so the thing is that some of them are very far off, or a huge amount of technological innovation would have to happen to make it work, and others are more interesting engineering and human factors problems. But yes, we are looking across that whole range because who knows what the solution will be. So that, that's really interesting. You, see, you talk about like, the long term there. Um, do you have uh, any you know, deadlines on when you've got to produce this stuff, or is it totally open-ended? Well, which is kind of a scary thing to shareholders, maybe. It, it is research, which I define as when you start, you don't know for sure that you can deliver what you started on. Um, and the way that I think about it is that when something is started, within three to 10 years, if it works out, that it you could imagine that it could ship in a product and really have impact. So it's not open-ended, and we don't have people who kind of think deep thoughts and things that maybe in 20 or 30 years could be interesting and publish a paper about it. But at the same time, we don't work on things that are obviously um, just engineering and deliverable. Well, speaking of publishing, um, you know, is the research you're coming up with uh, Oculus research uh, on the model of Facebook's approach to data centers, where it's all very open and they want to improve the world by sharing their information, or is it closer to 
um, what a traditional hardware manufacturer has in saying this is a competitive field, this is proprietary information. What, what, how, how do you view that and you know, can, how open are you about uh, maybe not in the middle of it, but eventually sharing your breakthroughs? Ultimately, we'd like to share all of the breakthroughs, but obviously, ultimately is a ways off. So we publish, and we do want to be sharing information. Um, it is not our priority to publish. It's a side effect of having done novel, innovative work. Mm -hmm. And you know, if folks here wanted to become part of your effort there, how, how would they go about that? Uh, well, we certainly have a page listing all of our openings, <laughs> and we would love to have people here uh, join us. Um, so we are looking for the best people in the world. And that's really the bottom line. This is going to be an, a long journey with a great many challenges, and we need great people. Uh, Facebook itself is you know, a, a huge you know, uh, consumer and creator of artificial intelligence there. What's the role of AI and machine learning and what, what you're doing? Machine learning is a critical part of making many of the systems that um, need to happen become good enough. So for example, if you take something like hand tracking, it can help a huge amount if what you do is you use machine learning to help, um, help start the searches for things. So it's not that you just throw things into a machine learning framework, but f machine learning can be critical for helping parts of various pipelines work much better. And so it's a hybrid system. Um, in the long run, I do expect that machine learning and AI will be a significant part of the whole virtual experience. Um, I mean, in the end, what we'd really love to have is a great assistant, right? Um, but that's not really something that I personally am working on. Um, what's the relationship between Oculus Research and the Oculus that we see here and, you know, and presents you know, the, 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 the products there? Is there stuff that you've done that are showing up in this generation of, of products. Um, talk about the pipeline. So the relationship is that our purpose is to put things into that pipeline and work with the product team so that everybody here gets to use them and gets the right software that leverages them. So that is, that's the reason we're here. Um, there's nothing in the current generation that has come from us because there hasn't been enough time to even hit that three-year time frame. But there are certainly a number of things that we could see over the next few years, and especially, certainly over the next five years, four years. Because <laughs> a year ago, I said, here's where I think we will be in five years, and obviously we play a part in that. For are you sure. on track with that? Are you, are you, now you, would you say the same things, here's where we'll be in the next four years? Yeah, I would say the same things. I might actually bump a few of them up. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, obviously, Mark came here earlier this morning and gave a really optimistic view of, of, uh, of VR and, you know, and where Oculus is going there. Um, has he been up to see you? Mark has been up to see us. He did post about it, so I don't think it'd be a big surprise to people. Um, and that was great. I th you know, Mark, Mark placed a great deal of trust in us to be going and doing worthwhile work. And when he came, it was a great experience to have him there. So give me more of a sense of what the world will be like when you uh, do realize, or if, you know, let's assuming you do, uh, what, what, what you want to do. What, what, how will our lives be different um, by switching to that platform? So the first thing I'll say is, you, you know, when you say when, if, th this is going to happen. It's really a question of how quickly it happens because it's not technologically impossible and it is so powerful that it will happen. So, I could be wrong, wait a minute, but wait a minute. I'm clear you know, on that. Right? So that, that, that's an amazing statement of confidence that, you know, maybe in this room, you know, it, it doesn't raise an eyebrow, but I, I think out, 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 outside of it would. Why are you so confident? You know, I, maybe if it can be done, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be done, that people will adopt it. Um, you know, uh, that, gr that grandmother in England was really cool to adopt it, but there might be some people who are a little reluctant to go there. I, certainly there will be, but so let's take ourselves back to 1973. And let's say that what we have is we have a Xerox Park Alto sitting on the table between us. Mm -hmm. And you'll be saying, well, what makes you say that everyone's going to be using these things? I mean, you know, you look at it, it's kind of big, it's kind of slow. What would they use it for? I remember back in the day what people would say is, well, you could use it to store recipes on, which was not the world's biggest winning argument. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, no one would have foreseen 
any of the things that came on top of that, right? They, they wouldn't have foreseen, for example, 3D real-time graphics. They wouldn't have foreseen Facebook. They wouldn't have foreseen the whole internet, right? And they certainly wouldn't have foreseen computers in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So it is true that one needs to have a little bit of vision here when you think about it. But to me, it is so obvious that just as back in 1973, you could have seen this unfolding, at least in general, by saying, wait a minute, you have access to all this information, all this computing power. It has to be incredibly valuable. Right. Now to say, what we have is we have access to driving your full perceptions with this so that you can actually be in this thing, experiencing this thing. So I've talked about you know, the one thing that I want is that virtual workspace. It's because that's the thing that would affect my life right now directly. What does that virtual workspace look like? The virtual workspace, to me, in the near future, meaning in the next maybe five years, you have a desk, right? You have a keyboard, you have a mouse. They're all mapped in by computer vision so you can use them but they're in a virtual space that reskins it and then puts up whatever else you want with it. So you could have 100 screens, you could have a hologram, you can have a whiteboard and be talking with someone else, other people can teleport in, they, uh, you can teleport into them, they can look over your shoulder, you can work together. Basically, think of it as, it's like your real workspace, except it's completely malleable. And that is, the, I see that because that's what would affect me, but there, if you look at other people, if you gave them access to it, they would see so many other things that were entertainment, productivity, um, just, for example, just being a tourist, going places, just visiting with other people. The, the potential really is kind of the potential of reality, right? Um, it's not even what is the killer app, because what's the killer app for reality? It's all the things you can do. Well, that, that's the thing that I, I loved about some, some of your talks there, when you really made a very convincing case that the reality that we think is our only reality is really, you know, just a construct that we make and the, what the people out here can develop can be with the right tools, you know, and the right system, you know, just as real, not only as real to us, but just as real as, you know, the things that our naked senses perceive there. And, you know, and I think, you know, unlike, you know, using the Alto, right, uh, there, there, there's a line that goes past when that thing you know, subsumes our reality, both in, you know, in VR and in a mixed reality situation. In some of your writings, it seems what, you, what you're going for is a way where you know, we'll be able to get 100% of at least our vision, you know, and you know, maybe I'll, I'll cover the years, to get replaced by a mix of, of what's piped in from you know, uh, the physical world, I don't want to say real, um, and what's built by people like the, the folks in this room, by, develop, by developers there. That to me is significantly different, and that's why you have so many challenges, because you're trying to make that leap over some uncanny valley into what is you know, totally just as real to us. Uh, that's absolutely right, and I do think that that mixing of real and virtual is is the key here because what it will do is it will expand the ranges of experiences that we can have and that we can allow other people to have. And really, I mean, that's what life's about is having experiences, right? With other people in other places. And we can make, basically, as it gets good enough, we can make almost anything possible. So one thing, you know, I think you allude to it in the essay you're going to publish today is uh, you have an, an apartment, you've built in a, like a real, apartment up there, of, you know, tell me about that. What's the point of building, you know, uh, a model apartment up there in, in Redmond? You know? Well, there are a couple of pieces to it. One of the parts is that if you want to know how people might use virtual reality, it would actually help, especially once it's mixed with the real world, with computer vision. It would help to know how people actually do use things. And so we can, rather than having people in some artificial study setting, what we do is we put them in an apartment and have them do real things. And then we can see what they would need to have available in terms of functionality. The other they're they're in, a, in an apartment wearing headsets or just in an apartment like watching TV or making, well, making you can noodles? Do, you can do both, right? I mean, it's study people's patterns and then to say, well, if you had a mix of real and virtual, now how would you use these things and what would be the problems that have to be solved? The other part is, if you're going to make a computer vision system, you need to know how good it is. And it helps to have ground truth. And this apartment is ground truth because we know exactly what is in it and where it is. Hmm. So do um, you think in, in our apartments, you know, that, that basically we'll get, you know, uh, the physical objects piped in and then, you know, so we'll, we won't bump into things, but, you know, we could make it uh, some other 
place. You know, it could be a, you know, like a palace or a cave. And one of the things that I think many of the people in this room will ultimately be doing interesting work with is you can reskin things, that's easy. You can put virtual things in the scene, not a big problem. Taking real things out of the scene, probably not. Oh. So the question is how you create interesting settings that adapt to what your physical surroundings are. You know, in, uh, it's just fascinating to speculate on, on what happens when we, you know, uh, go in to immerse ourselves in this artificially created, you know, uh, kind, kind of reality there. But in recent months, uh, we've been, you know, talking, the, the term alternative reality is being used in a, in a different context there, uh, in terms of, you know, political and even propaganda sense, of people talking about all alternate facts there. And I'm wondering, if this vision comes about, um, there might be ways to tinker with our reality there, uh, or, or even hack it. I'm wondering if we're going to be sitting here in 10 years talking not about fake news, but fake reality. Well, I mean, this, this is a technology, and how the technology gets used, what the framework around it is, is a separate thing. And I think that the point you raise is a great point to think about as this matures. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, do you have those kinds of conversations there, or is it just heads down, let's do the work? Um, the way I think about it is, first, we need to figure out how to make this work well enough, and once that's in sight, then it's useful to think about the entire framework. But right now, it is incredibly hard to move this forward, and that's really where all the attention is. And I, and I know that, you know, uh, we've been talking about the, 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 this earlier. Uh, to get, like, 95% of your scale of, of vision there, you know, is a huge gap between 100%. Does it have to be an all-or-nothing kind of thing to deliver the experiences you want to do? No, not at all. But 100%, boy, 100% is basically mapping to reality, right? And I think huh. that one is long way off. So the question is, in my mind, when do we even get to like 25%? Because there's so much more that can be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess, you know, uh, when you go back there, you know, what, what's the next thing that you're going to be, you know, uh, uh, doing it in, in, uh, at Oculus Research? What, what do you... What's your, your focus now? Is it, you know, uh, building the team? Uh, is there any area that you in particular are working on? Um, in particular, I'm working on building the team and overall the direction that we're moving in. But um, it, it, it isn't one thing. That's the fascinating part. This is a platform. And so, you know, you wouldn't have gone to Xerox Park and said, well, who's working on the mouse? Because a mouse without for example, windowing graphics without fonts, without a laser printer, it kind of limits what you can do. And so there's how do we get photons into your eyes better? How do we give you better computer vision for self-presence, for other people's presence, for the surroundings around you? How do we do audio better? How do we let you interact with the world better? It is a whole package. And each piece can move forward some on its own. But in the long run, you really want all the pieces to come together. And one really good example is, suppose that we magically let you use your hands perfectly in VR, right? You just reach out, you grab virtual objects. Well, remember that thing I said about where you're focused? Everything within hand's length wouldn't actually be very sharp and well-focused, right? Mm -hmm. So you really need to solve that problem, too. And it just goes on and on like that, where you need all these pieces to come together into the right system and platform. You know, um, I recently saw a, a, a system, you know, not, not in your lab, but uh, where they were, you know, using a, a, an armband to take, you know, uh, signals from the brain to control things. You know, uh, uh, I know elsewhere in Facebook they're working on the brain-machine interface. Could that be part of what you're doing? It absolutely could be. You know, the fascinating thing here is we are just at the beginning. I mean, everybody here is a pioneer on something, and I... I know that you're all excited about it. I know you think it's going to be big. I don't think you understand exactly how big it's going to be. I'm pretty sure if you went back to those people from Xerox Park in 1973 to now, and you said, did you realize how big this was going to be, how much you were going to change the world, they would never have realized that. And actually, I'll tell you a funny story, which is that I talked to one of the people who was key there, and I said, how did you have this vision? And he said, oh, we didn't actually have a vision. We were just working on a bunch of technologies. <laughs> um, so they didn't really realize what it was going to be. And, and someday, looking back, you will realize exactly how big this thing was and how important a part you played. And um, there's just so much to do. And it's so exciting.
Well, with that, I've, I've got to thank you. I, can't, I hope to see that one day. Thank you. Thank you.